Chapter 37 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 37 Private Letters, September 15th to October 1st, 1862. Telegram, Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, September 15th. We have carried the heights near here after a hard engagement and gained a glorious victory. All your particular friends, well. September 15th, Monday, 9.30 a.m., Bolivar. Just sent you a telegram informing you that we yesterday gained a glorious and complete victory. Every moment adds to its importance. I am pushing everything after them with the greatest rapidity and expect to gain great results. I thank God most humbly for his great mercy. How glad I am for my country that it is delivered from immediate peril. I am about starting with a pursuit and must close this. If I can believe one-tenth of what is reported, God has seldom given an army a greater victory than this. Telegram near Sharpsburg, September 16, 1862, 7 a.m. Have reached thus far and have no doubt delivered Pennsylvania and Maryland. Army in excellent spirits. September 18th, 8 a.m., camp near Sharpsburg. We fought yesterday a terrible battle against the entire rebel army. The battle continued 14 hours and was terrific. The fighting on both sides was superb. General result was in our favor. That is to say, we gained a great deal of ground and held it. It was a success, but whether a decided victory depends upon what occurs today. I hope that God has given us a great success. It is all in his hands, and there I am content to leave it. The spectacle yesterday was the grandest I could conceive of. Nothing could be more sublime. Those in whose judgment I rely tell me that I fought the battle splendidly, and that it was a masterpiece of art. I am well nigh tired out by anxiety and want of sleep. God has been good in sparing the lives of all my staff. Generals Hooker, Sedgwick, Dana, Richardson, and Hartsuff, and several other general officers wounded. Mansfield is dead, I fear, but am not certain. I just learned that he is not mortally wounded. September 20th, 8 a.m., Camp near Sharpsburg. Yesterday, the enemy completed his evacuation of Maryland, completely beaten. We got many prisoners, muskets, colors, cannon, etc. His loss in killed and wounded was very great, so is ours, unfortunately. General Mansfield was killed, or rather died of his wounds. General Sedgwick, Richardson, Dana, Brooks, Hooker, Weber, Rodman, and two others were wounded on Wednesday. Poor Henry Kingsbury died of his wounds the day after the battle. The battle lasted 14 hours and was, without doubt, the most severe ever fought on this continent, and few more desperate were ever fought anywhere. 9 a.m. I am glad to say that I am much better today, for to tell you the truth, I have been under the weather since the battle. The want of rest and anxiety brought on my old disease. The battle of Wednesday was a terrible one. I presume the loss will prove not less than 10,000 on each side. Our victory was complete, and the disorganized rebel army has rapidly returned to Virginia. Its dreams of invading Pennsylvania dissipated forever. I feel some little pride in having, with a beaten and demoralized army, defeated Lee so utterly and saved the North so completely. Well, one of these days history will, I trust, do me justice in deciding that it was not my fault that the campaign of the peninsula was not successful. Since I left Washington, Stanton has again asserted that I, not Pope, lost the Battle of Manassas Number 2. I am tired of fighting against such disadvantages and feel that it is now time for the country to come to my help and remove these difficulties from my path. If my countrymen will not open their eyes and assist themselves, they must pardon me if I decline longer to pursue the thankless avocation of serving them. September 20th, 9 p.m., Camp near Sharpsburg. I feel that I have done all that can be asked in twice saving the country. If I continue in its service, I have at least the right to demand a guarantee that I shall not be interfered with. I know I cannot have that assurance so long as Stanton continues in the position of Secretary of War and Halleck as General-in-Chief. 
I can retire from the service for sufficient reasons without leaving any stain upon my reputation. I feel now that this last short campaign is a sufficient legacy for our child, so far as honor is concerned. You should see my soldiers now. You never saw anything like their enthusiasm. It surpasses anything you ever imagined. My tent is filled quite to overflowing with trophies in the way of captured secesh battle flags. We have more than have been taken in all battles put together, and all sorts of inscriptions on them. September 21st, Sunday, A.M. Do you know that I have not heard one word from Halleck, the President, nor the Secretary of War about the last great battle? All except fault-finding that I have had since leaving Washington was one from the President about the Sunday battle, in which he says, God bless you and all with you. That is all I have, but plenty from Halleck couched in almost insulting language and prophesying disaster. I telegraphed him last night that I regretted the uniformly fault-finding tone of his dispatches, and that he had not as yet found leisure to notice the recent achievements of my army. September 22nd, 9 a.m. I rode out on the battlefield yesterday. The burial of the dead is, by this time, completed, and a terrible work it has been, for the slain counted by thousands on each side. I look upon this campaign as substantially ended, and my present intention is to seize Harper's Ferry and hold it with a strong force, then go to work and reorganize the army ready for another campaign. I shall not go to Washington, if I can help it, but will try to reorganize the army somewhere near Harper's Ferry or Frederick. It may be that, now that the government is pretty well over their scare, they will begin again with their persecutions and throw me overboard again. I don't care if they do. I have the satisfaction of knowing that God has, in his mercy, a second time made me the instrument for saving the nation, and am content with the honor that has fallen to my lot. I have seen enough of public life. No motive of ambition can now retain me in the service. The only thing that can keep me there will be the conviction that my country needs my services and that circumstances make it necessary for me to render them. I am confident that the poison still rankles in the veins of my enemies at Washington, and that so long as they live it will remain there. I have received no papers containing the news of the last battle, and do not know the effect it has produced on the northern mind. I trust it has been a good one, and that I am re-established in the confidence of the best people of the nation. Everything quiet today. Not a shot fired as yet. I am moving troops down to Harper's Ferry and hope to occupy it tomorrow. Then I will have the Potomac clear. September 23rd, Tuesday, 8 a.m., Sharpsburg Camp. The weather is splendid, though I should like a little rain to raise the Potomac slightly. We are all well. I am entirely well now, and rather better for my little attack of illness. September 25th, 7.30 a.m., we are so near the mountains that it is quite cold at night. I think the health of our men is improving much. They look a great deal better than they did on the peninsula. Eyes look brighter and faces better. My plans are not easily given, for I really do not know whether I am to do as I choose or not. I shall keep on doing what seems best until brought up with a round turn. My own judgment is to watch the line of the Potomac until the water rises, then to concentrate everything near Harper's Ferry, reorganize the army as promptly as possible, and then, if Secesh remains near Winchester, to attack him. If he retires, to follow him up and attack him near Richmond. It is very doubtful whether I shall remain in the service after the rebels have left this vicinity. The President's late proclamation, the continuation of Stanton and Halleck in office, render it almost impossible for me to retain my commission and self-respect at the same time. It is a mercy of God that none of my staff have been hit, considering how much they have been exposed to danger. They have had plenty of horses killed, sabers hit, clothes cut, etc., but have thus far escaped unhurt. I'm going on a visit to Harper's Ferry this morning. September 26, 10.30 p.m., Sharpsburg Camp. Pretty well tired out by a long ride to Harper's Ferry today. I rode down in my ambulance, but when there took a long and fatiguing ride on horseback over the Maryland Heights to determine upon the question of its defense. I did not have time to go over the Virginia side, but propose doing that tomorrow. Our camp will be thrown a little down in that direction tomorrow, so I shall not have quite so far to travel in returning. It is so cool this evening that I have a fire in front of my tent, 
and am sitting in my overcoat. September 29th, Sharpsburg, AM. I think Secesh has gone to Winchester. The last I heard last night was to that effect. If he has gone there, I will be able to arrange my troops more with a view to comfort, and, if it will only rain a little so as to raise the river, will feel quite justified in asking for a short leave. We are having very fine weather. Not yet even have I a word from anyone in Washington about the Battle of the Antietam, and nothing in regard to South Mountain, except from the President in the following. Your dispatch received. God bless you and all with you. Can't you beat them some more before they get off? I don't look for any thanks. P.M. I have been hard at work all day upon a preliminary report of the recent battles, and find that, in order to arrive at anything like the truth, I must tomorrow take all my aides to the ground and talk with them there. I would really prefer fighting three battles to writing the report of one. You can hardly imagine the difficulties of such a task. You are necessarily combating the amour propre of every officer concerned when you say one word in commendation of anybody else. I ought to treat Burnside very severely, and probably will. Yet I hate to do it. He is very slow, is not fit to command more than a regiment. If I treat him as he deserves, he will be my mortal enemy hereafter. If I do not praise him as he thinks he deserves, and as I know he does not, he will be at least a very lukewarm friend. I mention this merely as an instance that you will comprehend. October 1st, 7.30 a.m., a cloudy day. If it does not rain, I think I will go to Williamsport in Hagerstown today, to see that part of the country, for there is no telling but that I might have to fight a battle there one of these days, and it is very convenient to know the ground. In this last battle, the rebels possessed an immense advantage in knowing every part of the ground, while I only knew what I could see from a distance. I rode all over the battlefield again yesterday, so as to be sure that I understood it all before writing my report. I was but the more impressed with the great difficulties of the undertaking and the magnitude of the success. Did I tell you that our losses at South Mountain and Antietam amounted to within one or two hundred of fifteen thousand? That we took some six thousand prisoners, thirty-nine colors, fourteen guns, fourteen thousand five hundred small arms, etc., etc. Pretty fair trophies after a battle so stubbornly contested. Yesterday, I received at last a telegram from Halleck about the Battle of Antietam. I don't know where we are drifting, but do not like the looks of things. Time will show. I do not yet know what are the military plans of the gigantic intellects at the head of the government. End of chapter 37「Chapter thirty eight of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter thirty eight After the Battle The Position Reviewed Condition of the Army Reorganization and Supply Visit of the President He Approves McClellan's Course Details of supplies needed and not received. Shoes, clothing, blankets, tents, horses. Dates of receipt of supplies. Plans of advance into Virginia. The night brought with it grave responsibilities. Whether to renew the attack on the 18th or to defer it, even with the risk of the enemy's retirement, was the question before me. After a night of anxious deliberation and a full and careful survey of the situation and condition of our army, the strength and position of the enemy, I concluded that the success of an attack on the 18th was not certain. I am aware of the fact that, under ordinary circumstances, a general is expected to risk a battle if he has a reasonable prospect of success. But at this critical juncture, I should have had a narrow view of the condition of the country had I been willing to hazard another battle with less than an absolute assurance of success. At that moment, Virginia lost. Washington menaced. Maryland invaded. The national cause could afford no risks of defeat. One battle lost, and almost all would have been lost. Lee's army might then have marched as it pleased on Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, or New York. It could have levied its supplies from a fertile and undevastated country, extorted tribute from wealthy and populous cities, and nowhere east of the Alleghenies was there another organized force 
able to arrest its march. The following are among the considerations which led me to doubt the certainty of success in attacking before the 19th. The troops were greatly overcome by the fatigue and exhaustion attendant upon the long-continued and severely contested battle of the 17th, together with the long day and night marches to which they had been subjected during the previous three days. The supply trains were in the rear, and many of the troops had suffered from hunger. They required rest and refreshment. One division of Sumner's and all of Hooker's corps on the right had, after fighting most valiantly for several hours, been overpowered by numbers, driven back in great disorder, and much scattered, so that they were for the time somewhat demoralized. In Hooker's corps, according to the return made by General Meade commanding, there were but 6,729 men present on the 18th, whereas on the morning of the 22nd there were 13,093 men present for duty in the same corps, showing that previous to and during the battle, 6,364 men were separated from their command. General Meade, in an official communication upon this subject, dated September 18, 1862, says, I enclose a field return of the Corps, made this afternoon, which I desire you will lay before the commanding general. I am satisfied the great reduction in the Corps since the recent engagements is not due solely to the casualties of battle, and that a considerable number of men are still in the rear, some having dropped out on the march, and many dispersing and leaving yesterday during the fight. I think the efficiency of the Corps, so far as it goes, good. To resist an attack in our present strong position, I think they may be depended on, and I hope they will perform duty in case we make an attack, though I do not think their morale is as good for an offensive as a defensive movement. One division of Sumner's Corps had also been overpowered, and it was a good deal scattered and demoralized. It was not deemed by its corps commander in proper condition to attack the enemy vigorously the next day. Some of the new troops on the left, although many of them fought well during the battle and are entitled to great credit, were at the close of the action driven back and their morale impaired. On the morning of the 18th, General Burnside, as before stated, requested me to send him another division to assist in holding his position on the other side of the Antietam and to enable him to withdraw his corps if he should be attacked by a superior force. A large number of our heaviest and most efficient batteries had consumed all their ammunition on the 16th and 17th, and it was impossible to supply them until late on the following day. Supplies of provisions and forage had to be brought up and issued, and infantry ammunition distributed. Finally, reinforcements to the number of 14,000 men, to say nothing of troops expected from Pennsylvania, had not arrived, but were expected during the day. The 18th was, therefore, spent in collecting the dispersed, giving rest to the fatigued, removing the wounded, burying the dead, and the necessary preparations for a renewal of the battle. Of the reinforcements, Couch's division, marching with commendable rapidity, came up into position at a late hour in the morning. Humphrey's division of new troops, in their anxiety to participate in the battle which was raging when they received the order to march from Frederick at about half-past three p.m. on the 17th, pressed forward during the entire night, and the mass of the division reached the army during the following morning. Having marched more than 23 miles after half-past four o'clock on the preceding afternoon, they were, of course, greatly exhausted and needed rest and refreshment. Large reinforcements expected from Pennsylvania never arrived. During the 18th, orders were given for a renewal of the attack at daylight on the 19th. On the night of the 18th, the enemy, after passing troops in the latter part of the day from the Virginia shore to their position behind Sharpsburg, as seen by our officers, suddenly formed the design of abandoning their position and retreating across the river. As their line was but a short distance from the river, the evacuation presented but little difficulty and was effected before daylight. About 2,700 of the enemy's dead were, under the direction of Major Davis, Assistant Inspector General, counted and buried upon the battlefield of Antietam. A portion of their dead had been previously buried by them. When our cavalry advance reached the river on the morning of the 19th, it was discovered that nearly all the enemy's forces had crossed into Virginia during the night, their rear escaping under cover of eight batteries placed in strong positions upon the elevated bluffs on the opposite bank. General Porter, commanding the 5th Corps, ordered a detachment from Griffin's and Barnes's brigades, under General Griffin, to cross the river at dark and carry the enemy's batteries. 
This was gallantly done under the fire of the enemy. Several guns, caissons, etc., were taken, and their supports driven back half a mile. The information obtained during the progress of this affair indicated that the mass of the enemy had retreated on the Charlestown and Martinsburg roads towards Winchester. To verify this, and to ascertain how far the enemy had retired, General Porter was authorized to detach from his corps, on the morning of the 20th, a reconnoitering party in greater force. This detachment crossed the river and advanced about a mile, when it was attacked by a large body of the enemy lying in ambush in the woods, and driven back across the river with considerable loss. This reconnaissance showed that the enemy was still in force on the Virginia bank of the Potomac, prepared to resist our further advance. It was reported to me on the 19th that General Stewart had made his appearance at Williamsport with some 4,000 cavalry and six pieces of artillery, and that 10,000 infantry were marching on the same point from the direction of Winchester. I ordered General Couch to march at once with his division and a part of Pleasanton's cavalry, with Franklin's Corps within supporting distance, for the purpose of endeavoring to capture this force. General Couch made a prompt and rapid march to Williamsport and attacked the enemy vigorously, but they made their escape across the river. I dispatched the following telegraphic report to the General-in-Chief. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Sharpsburg, September 19, 1862. I have the honor to report that Maryland is entirely freed from the presence of the enemy who has been driven across the Potomac. No fears need now be entertained for the safety of Pennsylvania. I shall at once occupy Harper's Ferry. G. B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. Major General H. W. Halleck, Commanding U.S. Army. On the following day, September 20th, I received this telegram from General Halleck. We are still left entirely in the dark in regard to your own movements and those of the enemy. This should not be so. You should keep me advised of both so far as you know them. To which I answered as follows. September 20th. Your telegram of today is received. I telegraphed you yesterday all I knew and had nothing more to inform you of until this evening. Williams's Corps, Banks, occupied Maryland Heights at 1 p.m. today. The rest of the army is near here except Couch's division, which is at this moment engaged with the enemy in front of Williamsport. The enemy is retiring via Charlestown and Martinsburg on Winchester. He last night reoccupied Williamsport by a small force, but will be out of it by morning. I think he has a force of infantry near Shepherdstown. I regret that you find it necessary to couch every dispatch I have the honor to receive from you in a spirit of fault-finding, and that you have not yet found leisure to say one word in commendation of the recent achievements of this army, or even to allude to them. I have abstained from giving the number of guns, colors, small arms, prisoners, etc. captured, until I could do so with some accuracy. I hope by tomorrow evening to be able to give at least an approximate statement. On the same day I telegraphed as follows to General Halleck. September 20th. As the rebel army, now on the Virginia side of the Potomac, must in a great measure be dependent for supplies of ammunition and provisions upon Richmond, I would respectfully suggest that General Banks be directed to send out a cavalry force to cut their supply communication opposite Washington. This would seriously embarrass their operations and will aid this army materially. Maryland Heights were occupied by General Williams's Corps on this day, and on the 22nd, General Sumner took possession of Harper's Ferry. It will be remembered that at the time I was assigned to command the forces for the defense of the National Capital, on the second day of September 1862. The greater part of all the available troops were suffering under the disheartening influences of the serious defeat they had encountered during the brief and unfortunate campaign of General Pope. Their numbers were greatly reduced by casualties, their confidence was much shaken, and they had lost something of that esprit de corps which is indispensable to the efficiency of an army. Moreover, they had left behind, lost, or worn out the greater part of their clothing and camp equipage which required renewal before they could be in proper condition to take the field again. The intelligence that the enemy was crossing the Potomac into Maryland was received in Washington on the 4th of September, and the Army of the Potomac was again put in motion under my direction on the following day, so that but a very brief interval of time was allowed to reorganize or procure supplies. The Sanguinary Battles of South Mountain and Antietam, fought by this army a few days afterwards, with the reconnaissances immediately following, resulted in a loss to us of ten general officers, many regimental and company officers, 
and a large number of enlisted men, amounting in the aggregate to 15,220. Two army corps had been badly cut up, scattered, and somewhat demoralized in the action of the 17th. In General Sumner's corps alone, 41 commissioned officers and 819 enlisted men had been killed. Four general officers, 89 other commissioned officers, and 3,708 enlisted men had been wounded, besides 548 missing, making the aggregate loss of this splendid veteran corps in this one battle 5,209. In General Hooker's corps, the casualties of the same engagement amounted to 2,619. The entire army had been greatly exhausted by unavoidable overwork, fatiguing marches, hunger, and want of sleep and rest, previous to the last battle. When the enemy recrossed the Potomac into Virginia, the means of transportation at my disposal were inadequate to furnish a single day's supply of subsistence in advance. Many of the troops were new levies, some of whom had fought like veterans, but the morale of others had been a good deal impaired by those severely contested actions, and they required time to recover, as well as to acquire the necessary drill and discipline. Under these circumstances, I did not feel authorized to cross the river with the main army, over a very deep and difficult ford, in pursuit of the retreating enemy, known to be in strong force on the south bank, and thereby place that stream, which was liable at any time to rise above a fording stage, between my army and its base of supply. I telegraphed on the 22nd to the General-in-Chief as follows. As soon as the exigencies of the service will admit of it, this army should be reorganized. It is absolutely necessary to secure its efficiency that the old skeleton regiments should be filled up at once and officers appointed to supply the numerous existing vacancies. There are instances where captains are commanding regiments and companies are without a single commissioned officer. On the 23rd, the following was telegraphed to the General-in-Chief. From several different sources, I learned that General R.E. Lee is still opposite to my position at Leestown, between Shepherdstown and Martinsburg and that General Jackson is on the Opequin Creek, about three miles from its mouth, both with large force. There are also indications of heavy reinforcements moving towards them from Winchester and Charlestown. I have therefore ordered General Franklin to take position with his corps at the crossroads about one mile northwest of Bakersville, on the Bakersville and Williamsport Road, and General Couch to establish his division near Downsville, leaving sufficient force at Williamsport to watch and guard the ford at that place. The fact that the enemy remaining so long in our front and the indications of an advance of reinforcements seem to indicate that he will give us another battle with all his available force. As I mentioned to you before, our army has been very much reduced by casualties in the recent battles, and in my judgment all the reinforcements of old troops that can possibly be dispensed with around Washington and other places should be instantly pushed forward by rail to this army. A defeat at this juncture would be ruinous to our cause. I cannot think it possible that the enemy will bring any forces to bear upon Washington till after the question is decided here. But if he should, troops can soon be sent back from this army by rail to reinforce the garrison there. The evidence I have that reinforcements are coming to the rebel army consists in the fact that long columns of dust extending from Winchester to Charlestown, and from Charlestown in this direction, and also troops moving this way, were seen last evening. This is corroborated by citizens. General Sumner, with his corps and Williams's Banks's, occupies Harper's Ferry and the surrounding heights. I think he will be able to hold his position till reinforcements arrive. On the 27th, I made the following report. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, September 27th, 1862, 10 a.m. All the information in my possession goes to prove that the main body of the enemy is concentrated not far from Martinsburg, with some troops at Charlestown, not many at Winchester. Their movements of late have been an extension towards our right and beyond it. They are receiving reinforcements in Winchester, mainly. I think of conscripts, perhaps entirely so. This army is not now in condition to undertake another campaign, nor to bring on another battle unless great advantages are offered by some mistake of the enemy, or pressing military exigencies render it necessary. We are greatly deficient in officers. Many of the old regiments are reduced to mere skeletons. The new regiments need instruction. Not a day should be lost in filling the old regiments, our main dependence, 
and in supplying vacancies among the officers by promotion. My present purpose is to hold the army about as it is now, rendering Harper's Ferry secure and watching the river closely, intending to attack the enemy should he attempt to cross to this side. Our possession of Harper's Ferry gives us the great advantage of a secure debauch, but we cannot avail ourselves of it until the railroad bridge is finished because we cannot otherwise supply a greater number of troops than we now have on the Virginia side at that point. When the river rises so that the enemy cannot cross in force, I propose concentrating the army somewhere near Harper's Ferry, and then acting according to circumstances. Viz, moving on Winchester, if from the position and attitude of the enemy we are likely to gain a great advantage by doing so, or else devoting a reasonable time to the organization of the army and instruction of the new troops, preparatory to an advance on whatever line may be determined. In any event, I regard it as absolutely necessary to send new regiments at once to the old corps, for purposes of instruction, and that the old regiments be filled at once. I have no fears as to an attack on Washington by the line of Manassas. Holding Harper's Ferry, as I do, they will not run the risk of an attack on their flank and rear while they have the garrison of Washington in their front. I rather apprehend a renewal of the attempt in Maryland, should the river remain low for a great length of time, and should they receive considerable addition to their force. I would be glad to have Peck's division as soon as possible. I am surprised that Sigel's men should have been sent to western Virginia without my knowledge. The last I heard from you on the subject was that they were at my disposition. In the last battles, the enemy was undoubtedly greatly superior to us in number, and it was only by very hard fighting that we gained the advantage we did. As it was, the result was at one period very doubtful, and we had all we could do to win the day. If the enemy receives considerable reinforcements, and we none, it is possible that I may have too much on my hands in the next battle. My own view of the proper policy to be pursued is to retain in Washington merely the force necessary to garrison it, and to send everything else available to reinforce this army. The railways give us the means of promptly reinforcing Washington, should it become necessary. If I am reinforced as I ask, and am allowed to take my own course, I will hold myself responsible for the safety of Washington. Several persons recently from Richmond say that there are no troops there except conscripts, and they few in number. I hope to give you details as to late battles by this evening. I am about starting again for Harper's Ferry. G.B. McClellan, Major General Commanding. Major General Halleck, General-in-Chief Washington. The work of reorganizing, drilling, and supplying the Army I began at the earliest moment. The different corps were stationed along the river in the best positions to cover and guard the fords. The great extent of the riverfront from near Washington to Cumberland, some 150 miles, together with the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, was to be carefully watched and guarded to prevent, if possible, the enemy's raids. Reconnaissances upon the Virginia side of the river, for the purpose of learning the enemy's positions and movements, were made frequently, so that our cavalry, which from the time we left Washington had performed the most laborious service, and had from the commencement been deficient in numbers, was found totally inadequate to the requirements of the army. This overwork had broken down the greater part of the horses, disease had appeared among them, and but a very small portion of our original cavalry force was fit for service. To such an extent had this arm become reduced that when General Stuart made his raid into Pennsylvania on the 11th of October with 2,000 men, I could only mount 800 men to follow him. Harper's Ferry was occupied on the 22nd, and in order to prevent a catastrophe similar to the one which had happened to Colonel Miles, I immediately ordered Maryland, Bolivar, and Loudoun Heights to be strongly fortified. This was done as far as the time and means at our disposal permitted. The main army of the enemy during this time remained in the vicinity of Martinsburg and Bunker Hill, and occupied itself in drafting and coercing every able-bodied citizen into the ranks, forcibly taking their property where it was not voluntarily offered, burning bridges, and destroying railroads. On the first day of October, His Excellency the President honored the Army of the Potomac with a visit, and remained several days, during which he went through the different encampments, reviewed the troops, and went over the battlefields of South Mountain and Antietam. I had the opportunity during this visit to describe to him the operations of the Army since the time it left Washington, and gave him my reasons for not following the enemy after he crossed the Potomac. He was accompanied by General McClernand, G. 
John W. Garrett, the Secretary of State of Illinois, and others whom I have forgotten. During the visit we had many and long consultations alone. I urged him to follow a conservative course, and supposed from the tenor of his conversation that he would do so. He more than once assured me that he was fully satisfied with my whole course from the beginning, that the only fault he could possibly find was that I was perhaps too prone to be sure that everything was ready before acting, but that my actions were all right when I started. I said to him that I thought a few experiments with those who acted before they were ready would probably convince him that in the end I consumed less time than they did. He told me that he regarded me as the only general in the service capable of organizing and commanding a large army, and that he would stand by me. We parted on the field of South Mountain, whither I had accompanied him. He said there that he did not see how we ever gained that field, and that he was sure that, if I had defended it, Lee could never have carried it. We spent some time on the battlefield and conversed fully on the state of affairs. He told me that he was entirely satisfied with me and with all that I had done, that he would stand by me against all comers, that he wished me to continue my preparations for a new campaign, not to stir an inch until fully ready, and when ready, to do what I thought best. He repeated that he was entirely satisfied with me, that I should be let alone, that he would stand by me. I have no doubt that he meant exactly what he said. He parted from me with the utmost cordiality. We never met again on this earth. He had hardly reached Washington before Cox's division was taken from me and the order of October 6th reached me, a singular commentary on the uncertainty of human affairs. On the 5th of October, the division of General Cox, about 5,000 men, was ordered from my command to Western Virginia. On the 7th of October, I received the following telegram from General Halleck. October 6th, I am instructed to telegraph you as follows. The President directs that you cross the Potomac and give battle to the enemy or drive him south. Your army must move now while the roads are good. If you cross the river between the enemy and Washington and cover the latter by your operation, you can be reinforced with 30,000 men. If you move up the valley of the Shenandoah, not more than 12,000 or 15,000 can be sent to you. The President advises the interior line between Washington and the enemy, but does not order it. He is very desirous that your army move as soon as possible. You will immediately report what line you adopt and when you intend to cross the river, also to what point the reinforcements are to be sent. It is necessary that the plan of your operations be positively determined on before orders are given for building bridges and repairing railroads. I am directed to add that the Secretary of War and the General-in-Chief fully concur with the President in these instructions. On the 10th of October, Stuart crossed the river at McCoy's Ferry with 2,000 cavalry and a battery of horse artillery on his raid into Maryland and Pennsylvania, making it necessary to use all our cavalry against him. This exhausting service completely broke down nearly all of our cavalry horses and rendered a remount absolutely indispensable before we could advance on the enemy. At the time I received the order of October 6th to cross the river and attack the enemy, the army was wholly deficient in cavalry, and a large part of our troops were in want of shoes, blankets, and other indispensable articles of clothing, notwithstanding all the efforts that had been made since the Battle of Antietam, and even prior to that date, to refit the army with clothing as well as horses. I at once consulted with Colonel Ingalls, the chief quartermaster, who believed that the necessary articles could be supplied in about three days. Orders were immediately issued to the different commanders, who had not already sent in their requisitions to do so at once, and all the necessary steps were forthwith taken by me to ensure a prompt delivery of the supplies. The requisitions were forwarded to the proper department at Washington, and I expected that the articles would reach our depots during the three days specified but day after day elapsed, and only a small portion of the clothing arrived. Corps commanders, upon receiving notice from the quartermasters that they might expect to receive their supplies at certain dates, sent the trains for them, which, after waiting, were compelled to return empty. Several instances occurred where the trains went back and forth from the camps to the depots as often as four or five different times, without receiving their supplies and I was informed by one corps commander that his wagon train had traveled over 150 miles to and from the depots before he succeeded in obtaining his clothing. 
The Corps of General Franklin did not get its clothing until after it had crossed the Potomac and was moving into Virginia. General Reynolds' Corps was delayed a day at Berlin to complete its supplies, and General Porter only completed his on reaching the vicinity of Harper's Ferry. I made every exertion in my power, and my quartermasters did the same, to have these supplies hurried forward rapidly, and I was repeatedly told that they had filled the requisitions at Washington, and that the supplies had been forwarded. But they did not come to us, and of course were inaccessible to the army. I did not fail to make frequent representation of this condition of things to the general-in-chief, and it appears that he referred the matter to the quartermaster general, who constantly replied that the supplies had been promptly ordered. Notwithstanding this, they did not reach our depots. The following extracts are from telegrams upon this subject. To General Halleck, October 11th. We have been making every effort to get supplies of clothing for this army, and Colonel Ingalls has received advices that it has been forwarded by railroad. But owing to bad management on the roads, or from some other cause, it comes in very slowly, and it will take a much longer time than was anticipated to get articles that are absolutely indispensable to the army, unless the railroad managers forward supplies more rapidly. To General Halleck, October 11th. I am compelled again to call your attention to the great efficiency of shoes and other indispensable articles of clothing that still exists in some of the corps in this army. Upon the assurances of the chief quartermaster, who based his calculation upon information received from Washington, that clothing would be forwarded at certain times, corps commanders sent their wagons to Hagerstown and Harper's Ferry for it. It did not arrive as promised and has not yet arrived. Unless some measures are taken to ensure the prompt forwarding of these supplies, there will necessarily be a corresponding delay in getting the army ready to move, as the men cannot march without shoes. Everything has been done that can be done at these headquarters to accomplish the desired result. To General Halleck, October 15th, I am using every possible exertion to get this army ready to move. It was only yesterday that a part of our shoes and clothing arrived at Hagerstown. It is being issued to the troops as rapidly as possible. To Colonel Ingalls, October 15th, General Franklin reports that there is by no means as much clothing as was called for at Hagerstown. I think, therefore, you had better have additional supplies, especially of shoes, forwarded to Harper's Ferry as soon as possible. To Colonel Ingalls, October 16th, General J. F. Reynolds just telegraphs as follows. My quartermaster reports that there are no shoes, tents, blankets, or knapsacks at Hagerstown. He was able to procure only a complete supply of overcoats and pants, with a few socks, drawers, and coats. This leaves many of the men yet without a shoe. My requisitions call for 5,255 pairs of shoes. Please push the shoes and stockings up to Harper's Ferry as fast as possible. From General Sumner, October 7th. I have given orders upon orders about the clothing, but my officers can get nothing from Washington, and some staff officers there had the impudence to say that I had no right to sign requisitions. From Colonel Ingalls, October 9th. You did right in sending clothing to Harper's Ferry. You will not be able to send too much or too quickly. We want blankets, shoes, canteens, etc. very much. From Colonel Ingalls, the quartermaster in Philadelphia, October 10th. Shipments to Hagerstown must be made direct through to avoid the contemptible delays at Harrisburg. If Colonel Crossman was ordered to send clothing, I hope he has sent it, for the suffering and impatience are excessive. From Colonel Ingalls, October 13th. Has the clothing arrived yet? If not, do you know where it is? What clothing was taken by the rebels at Chambersburg? Did they capture any property that was en route to you? Have we not got clothing at Harrisburg? Send an agent over the road to obtain information and hurry up the supplies. Reply at once. From General Halleck, October 13th. Your telegram in regard to supplies has been referred to the Quartermaster General, and he replies that everything asked for had been sent or ordered. The movement of your reinforcements by railroads has probably delayed the transportation of some portion of them. It is difficult to supply the waste of horses. From F. Lowry, Captain and Quartermaster, October 15th. I have just returned from Hagerstown, where I have been for the clothing for the Corps. There was nothing there but overcoats, trousers, and a few uniform coats and socks. 
There were not any shoes, blankets, shirts, or shelter tents. Will you please tell me where and when the balance can be had? Shall I send the Harper's Ferry for them tomorrow? The Corps surgeon has just made a requisition for 45 hospital tents. There are none at Hagerstown. Will you please inform me if I can get them at Harper's Ferry? From Assistant Quartermaster G.W. Weeks, October 15th. I want at least 10,000 suits of clothing in addition to what I've received. It should be here now. From A. Bliss, Captain and Assistant Quartermaster, October 22nd. We have booties, 12,000. Greatcoats, 4,000. Drawers and shirts are gone. Blankets and stockings nearly so. 15,000 each of these four articles are wanted. From Colonel Ingalls, October 24th. Please send to Captain Bliss at Harper's Ferry 10,000 blankets, 12,000 caps, 5,000 overcoats, 10,000 pairs booties, 2,000 pairs artillery and cavalry boots, 15,000 pairs stockings, 15,000 drawers, and 15,000 pants. The clothing arrives slowly. Can it not be hurried along faster? May I ask you to obtain authority for this shipment? From Captain Weeks, October 30th. Clothing has arrived this morning, none taken by rebels. Shall I supply Franklin and retain portions for Porter and Reynolds until called for? End of Part 1 of Chapter 38「Chapter 38 of McClellan's Own Story by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 38, Part 2 The following statement, taken from a report of the Chief Quartermaster with the Army, will show what progress was made in supplying the Army with clothing from the 1st of September to the date of crossing the Potomac on the 31st of October, and that a greater part of the clothing did not reach our depots until after the 14th of October. Statement of clothing and equipage received at the different depots of the Army of the Potomac from September 1st, 1862 to October 31st, 1863. Received at the depots from September 1st to October 6th. Drawers, 10,700. Forge caps, 4,000. Stockings, 6,200. Sack coats, 4,190. Cavalry jackets, 3,000. Canteens, 6,000. Flannel shirts, 6,200. Haversacks, 6,000. Trousers mounted, 4,200. Boots, 4,200. Shelter tents, 11,100. From October 6th to October 15th. Drawers, 17,000. Forge caps, 11,000. Stockings, 25,025. Cavalry jackets, 500. Canteens, 10,221. Flannel shirts, 18,325. Haversacks, 12,989. Trousers mounted, 1,000. Boots, 6,000. Shelter tents, 3,000. From October 15th to October 25th, drawers, 40,000. Forage caps, 19,500. Stockings, 65,200. Cavalry jackets, 1,250. Canteens, 9,000. Flannel shirts, 18,876. Haversacks, 5,000. Trousers mounted, 2,500. Boots, 3,600. Shelter tents, 9,000. From October 25th to October 31st, drawers, 30,000. Stockings, 30,000. Cavalry jackets, 1,500. Canteens, 3,008. Flannel shirts, 2,200. Haversacks, 9,900. Trousers mounted, 5,000. Boots, 20,040. Total, drawers, 97,700. Forage caps, 34,500. Stockings, 123,425. Sack coats, 4,190. Cavalry jackets, 6,250, canteens, 28,229, flannel shirts, 45,601, haversacks, 33,889, trousers mounted, 12,700, boots, 33,840, shelter tents, 23,100. 
Statement of clothing and equipage received, continued. Received at the depots from September 1st to October 6th. Camp kettles, 799. Mess pans, 2,030. Overcoats, foot, 3,500. Artillery jackets, 1,200. Blankets, 20. Overcoats mounted, 1,200. Felt hats, 2,200. Infantry coats, 2,000. Trousers, foot, 2,000. Booties, 2,000. From October 6th to October 15th, camp kettles, 1,302. Mess pans, 2,100. Overcoats, foot, 12,000. Artillery jackets, 500. Overcoats mounted, 875. Felt hats, 7,000. Infantry coats, 12,060. Trousers, foot, 9,800. Booties, 7,000. Knit shirts, 2,655. From October 15th to October 25th, camp kettles, 1,894. Mess pans, 4,500. Overcoats, foot, 14,770. Artillery jackets, 1,750. Blankets, 6,500. Overcoats mounted, 3,500. Infantry coats, 22,500. Trousers, foot, 39,620. Booties, 52,900. Knit shirts, 2,424. From October 25th to October 31st. Artillery jackets, 1,000. Blankets, 4,384. Overcoats mounted, 2,015. Infantry coats, 7,500. Trousers, foot, 25,000. Knit shirts, 11,595. Total. Camp kettles, 3,995. Mess pans, 8,630. Overcoats, foot, 30,270. Artillery jackets, 4,450. Blankets, 10,904. Overcoats mounted, 7,590. Felt hats, 9,200. Infantry coats, 44,060. Trousers foot, 76,120. Booties, 61,900. Knit shirts, 16,674. Colonel Ingalls, Chief Quartermaster, in his report upon this subject says, There was great delay in receiving our clothing. The orders were promptly given by me and approved by General Miggs, but the roads were slow to transport, particularly the Cumberland Valley Road. For instance, clothing ordered to Hagerstown on the 7th October for the Corps of Franklin, Porter, and Reynolds did not arrive there until about the 18th, and by that time, of course, there were increased wants and changes in position of troops. The clothing of Sumner arrived in great quantities near the last of October, almost too late for issue, as the army was crossing into Virginia. We finally left 50,000 suits at Harper's Ferry, partly on the cars just arrived and partly in store. The causes of the reduction of our cavalry force have already been recited. The difficulty in getting new supplies from the usual sources led me to apply for and obtain authority for the cavalry and artillery officers to purchase their own horses. The followings are the telegrams and letters on this subject. To General Halleck, October 12th, it is absolutely necessary that some energetic means be taken to supply the cavalry of this army with remount horses. The present rate of supply is 1050 per week for the entire army here and in front of Washington. From this number, the artillery draw for their batteries. To General Halleck, October 14th. With my small cavalry force, it is impossible for me to watch the line of the Potomac properly, or even make the reconnaissances that are necessary for our movements. This makes it necessary for me to weaken my line very much by extending the infantry to guard the innumerable fords. This will continue until the river rises, and it will be next to impossible to prevent the rebel cavalry raids. My cavalry force, as I urged this morning, should be largely and immediately increased under any hypothesis, whether to guard the river or advance on the enemy or both. The following was received October 25, 1862 from Washington, 4.50 p.m. To Major General McClellan, I have just received your dispatch about sore-tongued and fatigued horses. Will you pardon me for asking what the horses of your army have done since the Battle of Antietam 
that fatigues anything? A. Lincoln. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, October 25th, 6 p.m., 1862. His Excellency the President. In reply to your telegram of this date, I have the honor to state that from the time this army left Washington on the 7th of September, my cavalry has been constantly employed in making reconnaissances, scouting, and picketing. Since the Battle of Antietam, six regiments have made one trip of 200 miles, marching 55 miles in one day while endeavoring to reach Stuart's cavalry. General Pleasanton, in his official report, states that he, with the remainder of our available cavalry while on Stuart's track, marched 78 miles in 24 hours. Besides these two remarkable expeditions, our cavalry has been engaged in picketing and scouting 150 miles of riverfront ever since the Battle of Antietam, and has made repeated reconnaissances since that time, engaging the enemy on every occasion. Indeed, it has performed harder service since the battle than before. I beg you will also consider that this same cavalry was brought from the peninsula, where it encountered most laborious service, and was at the commencement of this campaign in low condition, and from that time to the present it has had no time to recruit. If any instance can be found where overworked cavalry has performed more labor than mine since the Battle of Antietam, I am not conscious of it. George B. McClellan, Major General. The following was received October 24th from Cherry Run, 12 noon. To Colonel A. V. Colburn. I have great difficulty in obtaining spies and guides without payment. Would it not be well to have sent to my acting division quartermaster, First Lieutenant John S. Schultz, $500 for that purpose? Colonel Williams reports, 11 a.m. today, I have in camp 267 horses belonging to officers and men. Of these, 128 are positively and absolutely unable to leave the camp from the following causes, viz. sore tongue, grease and consequent lameness, and sore backs. For example, the 5th U.S. Cavalry has now in camp 70 horses. Of these, 53 are worthless from the above causes. Out of 139 horses, the remainder, I do not believe, 50 can trot 8 miles. The other portion of my command, now absent on picket duty, has horses which are about in the same condition as no selection unless absolutely necessary has been made. The number of soreback horses, exceedingly small, the diseases are principally grease, sore tongue. The horses which are still sound are absolutely broken down from fatigue and want of flesh. I will also remark that the men of my command are much in want of clothing. Colonel Williams. The cavalry should therefore be changed, I think, and their number increased to 1,000 with one battery of horse artillery. I would respectfully desire to have Colonel Williams in command. John Newton, Brigadier General Commanding. Colonel Colburn, telegraph from Washington, October 25th. To General McClellan, I went this morning to see General Halleck and spoke to him about the bridges, etc., and also about rebuilding the road to Winchester and prolonging it to Strasburg. Also about the forces to be left at Harper's Ferry and what was to be done in the Shenandoah provided the enemy fell back. The only answer I could get was that they had nothing to do with the present campaign and that you ought to be able to decide in the premises. There was no use of trying to explain matters to him, because he would not listen to anything. When I spoke to him about the cavalry horses, he said that that was the quartermaster's business, and he had nothing to do with it. I will try again, but think it no use. The following is an extract from the official report of Colonel Ingalls. Immediately after the Battle of Antietam, efforts were made to supply deficiencies in clothing and horses. Large requisitions were prepared and sent in. The artillery and cavalry required large numbers to cover losses sustained in battle, on the march, and by diseases. Both of these arms were deficient when they left Washington. A most violent and destructive disease made its appearance at this time, which put nearly 4,000 animals out of service. Horses reported perfectly well one day would be dead lame the next, and it was difficult to foresee where it would end or what number would cover the loss. They were attacked in the hoof and tongue. No one seemed able to account for the appearance of this disease. Animals kept at rest would recover in time, but could not be worked. I made application to send west and purchase horses at once, but it was refused, on the ground that the outstanding contracts provided for enough, but they were not delivered sufficiently fast, nor in sufficient numbers. Until late in October and early in November, I was authorized to buy 2,500 late in October, 
but the delivery was not completed until in November after we had reached Warrington. In a letter from General Miggs, written on the 14th of October and addressed to the General-in-Chief, it is stated, There have been issued, therefore, to the Army of the Potomac, since the battles in front of Washington, to replace losses, 9,254 horses. What number of horses were sent to General Pope before his return to Washington, I have no means of determining. But the following statement, made upon my order by the Chief Quartermaster with the Army, and who had means for gaining accurate information, forces upon my mind the conclusion that the Quartermaster General was in error. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Chief Quartermaster's Office, October 31, 1862. Horses purchased September 6, 1862 by Colonel Ingalls, Chief Quartermaster, and issued to the forces under the immediate command of Major General George B. McClellan, 1,200. Issued and turned over to the above force by Captain J.J. J. Dana, Assistant Quartermaster in Washington, 2,261. Issued to forces at and near Washington, which have since joined the command, 352. Total, purchased by Colonel Ingalls and issued and turned over by Captain Dana to the forces in this immediate command, 3,813. Issued by Captain J.J. J. Dana, Assistant Quartermaster, to the forces in the vicinity of Washington, 3,363. Grand total purchased by Colonel R. Ingalls, Chief Quartermaster, and issued and turned over by Captain J.J. J. Dana, Assistant Quartermaster, to the entire Army of the Potomac and the forces around Washington, 7,176. About 3,000 horses have been turned over to the Quartermaster's Department by officers as unfit for service. Nearly 1,500 should now be turned over also, being worn out and diseased. Respectfully submitted, Fred Myers, Lieutenant Colonel and Quartermaster. This official statement, made up from the reports of the quartermasters who received and distributed the horses, exhibits the true state of the case, and gives the total number of horses received by the Army of the Potomac and the troops around Washington during a period of eight weeks as 7,176, or 2,078 less than the number stated by the quartermaster general. Supposing that 1,500 were issued to the Army under General Pope, Previous to its return to Washington, as General Miggs states, there would still remain 578 horses which he does not account for. The letter of the General-in-Chief to the Secretary of War on the 28th of October and the letter of General Miggs to the General-in-Chief on the 14th of October convey the impression that, upon my repeated applications for cavalry and artillery horses for the Army of the Potomac, I had received a much greater number than was really the case. It will be seen from Colonel Meyer's report that of all the horses alluded to by General Miggs, only 3,813 came to the army with which I was ordered to follow and attack the enemy. Of course, the remainder did not in the slightest degree contribute to the efficiency of the cavalry or artillery of the army with which I was to cross the river. Neither did they in the least facilitate any preparations for carrying out the order to advance upon the enemy as the General-in-Chief's letter might seem to imply. During the same period that we were receiving the horses alluded to, about 3,000 of our old stock were turned into the Quartermaster's Department, and 1,500 more reported as in such condition that they ought to be turned in as unfit for service, thus leaving the active army some 700 short of the number required to make good existing deficiencies to say nothing of providing remounts for men whose horses had died or been killed during the campaign and those previously dismounted. Notwithstanding all the efforts made to obtain a remount, there were, after deducting the force engaged in picketing the river, but about a thousand serviceable cavalry horses on the 21st day of October. In a letter dated October 14, 1862, the General-in-Chief says, it is also reported to me that the number of animals with your army in the field is about 31,000. It is believed that your present proportion of cavalry and of animals is much larger than that of any other of our armies. What number of animals our other armies had, I am not prepared to say. But military men in European armies have been of the opinion that an army to be efficient, while carrying on active operations in the field, should have a cavalry force equal in numbers to from one-sixth to one-fourth of the infantry force. My cavalry did not amount to one-twentieth part of the army, and hence the necessity of giving every one of my cavalry soldiers a serviceable horse. Cavalry may be said to constitute the antennae of an army. 
It scouts all the roads in front, on the flanks, and in the rear of the advancing columns, and constantly feels the enemy. The amount of labor falling on this arm during the Maryland campaign was excessive. The persons not familiar with the movements of troops and the amount of transportation required for a large army marching away from water or railroad communications, the number of animals mentioned by the general-in-chief may have appeared unnecessarily large. But to a military man who takes the trouble to enter into an accurate and detailed computation of the number of pounds of subsistence and forage required for such an army as that of the Potomac, it will be seen that the 31,000 animals were considerably less than what was absolutely necessary to an advance. As we were required to move through a country which could not be depended upon for any of our supplies, it became necessary to transport everything in wagons and to be prepared for all emergencies. I did not consider it safe to leave the river without subsistence and forage for ten days. The official returns of that date show the aggregate strength of the army for duty to have been about 110,000 men of all arms. This did not include Teamsters, citizen employees, officers, servants, etc., amounting to some 12,000, which gave a total of 122,000 men. The subsistence alone of this army for 10 days required for its transportation 1,830 wagons at 2,000 pounds to the wagon and 10,980 animals. Our cavalry horses at that time amounted to 5,046 and our artillery horses to 6,836. To transport full forage for these 22,862 animals for 10 days required 17,832 additional animals, and this forage would only supply the entire number, 40,694, of animals, with a small fraction over half allowance for the time specified. It will be observed that this estimate does not embrace the animals necessary to transport quartermaster supplies, baggage, camp equipage, ambulances, reserve ammunition, forage for officers' horses, etc., which would greatly augment the necessary transportation. It may very truly be said that we did make the march with the means at our disposal, but it will be remembered that we met with no serious opposition from the enemy, neither did we encounter delays from any other cause. The roads were in excellent condition, and the troops marched with the most commendable order and celerity. If we had met with a determined resistance from the enemy, and our progress had been very much retarded thereby, we would have consumed our supplies before they could have been renewed. A proper estimate of my responsibilities as the commander of that army did not justify me in basing my preparations for the expedition upon the supposition that I was to have an uninterrupted march. On the contrary, it was my duty to be prepared for all emergencies, and not the least important of my responsibilities was the duty of making ample provision for supplying my men and animals with rations and forage. Knowing the solicitude of the President for an early movement, and sharing with him fully his anxiety for prompt action, on the 21st of October I telegraphed to the General-in-Chief as follows. October 21st. Since the receipt of the President's order to move on the enemy, I have been making every exertion to get this army supplied with clothing absolutely necessary for marching. This, I am happy to say, is now nearly accomplished. I have also during the same time repeatedly urged upon you the importance of supplying cavalry and artillery horses to replace those broken down by hard service, and steps have been taken to ensure a prompt delivery. Our cavalry, even when well supplied with horses, is much inferior in number to that of the enemy, but inefficiency has proved itself superior. So forcibly has this been impressed upon our old regiments by repeated successes that the men are fully persuaded that they are equal to twice their number of rebel cavalry. Exclusive of the cavalry force now engaged in picketing the river, I have not at present over about 1,000 horses for service. Officers have been sent in various directions to purchase horses, and I expect them soon. Without more cavalry horses, our communications, from the moment we march, would be at the mercy of the large cavalry force of the enemy, and it would not be possible for us to cover our flanks properly, or to obtain the necessary information of the position and movements of the enemy in such a way as to ensure success. My experience has shown the necessity of a large and efficient cavalry force. Under the foregoing circumstances, I beg leave to ask whether the President desires me to march on the enemy at once, or to wait the reception of the new horses, every possible step having been taken to ensure their prompt arrival. 
On the same day, General Halleck replied as follows. October 21st. Your telegram of 12 noon has been submitted to the President. He directs me to say that he has no change to make in his order of the 6th instant. If you have not been and are not now in condition to obey it, you will be able to show such want of ability. The President does not expect impossibilities, but he is very anxious that all this good weather should not be wasted in inactivity. Telegraph when you will move and on what lines you propose to march. From the tenor of this dispatch, I conceived that it was left for my judgment to decide whether or not it was possible to move with safety to the Army at that time. And this responsibility I exercised with the more confidence in view of the strong assurances of his trust in me, as commander of that army, with which the President had seen fit to honor me during his last visit. The cavalry requirements, without which an advance would have been in the highest degree injudicious and unsafe, were still wanting. The country before us was an enemy's country, where the inhabitants furnished to the enemy every possible assistance, providing food for men and forage for animals, giving all information concerning our movements, and rendering every aid in their power to the enemy's cause. It was manifest that we should find it, as we subsequently did, a hostile district, where we could derive no aid from the inhabitants that would justify dispensing with the active cooperation of an efficient cavalry force. Accordingly, I fixed upon the 1st of November as the earliest date at which the forward movement could well be commenced. The General-in-Chief, in a letter to the Secretary of War on the 28th of October, says, In my opinion, there has been no such want of supplies in the Army under General McClellan as to prevent his compliance with the orders to advance against the enemy. Notwithstanding this opinion expressed by such high authority, I am compelled to say again that the delay in the reception of necessary supplies up to that date had left the army in a condition totally unfit to advance against the enemy, that an advance under the existing circumstances would, in my judgment, have been attended with the highest degree of peril, with great suffering and sickness among the men, and with imminent danger of being cut off from our supplies by the superior cavalry force of the enemy, and with no reasonable prospect of gaining any advantage over him. I dismiss this subject with the remark that I have found it impossible to resist the force of my own convictions, that the commander of an army who, from the time of its organization, has for eighteen months been in constant communication with its officers and men, the greater part of the time engaged in active service in the field, and who has exercised this command in many battles, must certainly be considered competent to determine whether his army is in proper condition to advance on the enemy or not and he must necessarily possess greater facilities for forming a correct judgment in regard to the wants of his men and the condition of his supplies than the general-in-chief in his office at Washington City. The movement from Washington into Maryland, which culminated in the battles of South Mountain and Antietam, was not a part of an offensive campaign with the object of the invasion of the enemy's territory and an attack upon its capital, but was defensive in its purposes, although offensive in its character and would be technically called a defensive-offensive campaign. It was undertaken at a time when our army had experienced severe defeats, and its object was to preserve the national capital and Baltimore, to protect Pennsylvania from invasion, and to drive the enemy out of Maryland. These purposes were fully and finally accomplished by the Battle of Antietam, which brought the Army of the Potomac into what might be termed an accidental position on the Upper Potomac. Having gained the immediate object of the campaign, the first thing to be done was to ensure Maryland from a return of the enemy, the second to prepare our own army, exhausted by a series of severe battles, destitute to a great extent of supplies, and very deficient in artillery and cavalry horses, for a definite offensive movement, and to determine upon the line of operations for a further advance. At the time of the Battle of Antietam, the Potomac was very low and presented a comparatively weak line of defense unless watched by large masses of troops. The reoccupation of Harper's Ferry and the disposition of troops above that point rendered the line of the Potomac secure against everything except cavalry raids. No time was lost in placing the army in proper condition for an advance, and the circumstances which caused the delay after the Battle of Antietam have been fully enumerated. I never regarded Harper's Ferry or its vicinity as a proper base of operations, for a movement upon Richmond. I still considered the line of the peninsula as the true approach, 
but for obvious reasons did not make any proposal to return to it. On the 6th of October, as stated above, I was ordered by the President, through his General-in-Chief, to cross the Potomac and give battle to the enemy or drive him south. Two lines were presented for my choice. First, up the valley of the Shenandoah, in which case I was to have 12,000 to 15,000 additional troops. Second, to cross between the enemy and Washington, that is, east of the Blue Ridge, in which event I was to be reinforced with 30,000 men. At first I determined to adopt the line of the Shenandoah, for these reasons. The Harper's Ferry and Winchester Railroad, and the various turnpikes converging upon Winchester, afforded superior facilities for supplies. Our cavalry being weak, this line of communication could be more easily protected. There was no advantage in interposing at that time the Blue Ridge and the Shenandoah between the enemy and myself. At the period in question, the Potomac was still very low, and I apprehended that if I crossed the river below Harper's Ferry, the enemy would promptly check the movement by recrossing into Maryland, at the same time covering his rear by occupying in strong force the passes leading through the Blue Ridge from the southeast into the Shenandoah Valley. I anticipated, as the result of the first course, that Lee would fight me near Winchester, if he could do so under favorable circumstances or else that he would abandon the lower Shenandoah and leave the Army of the Potomac free to act upon some other line of operations. If he abandoned the Shenandoah, he would naturally fall back upon his railway communications. I have since been confirmed in the belief that if I had crossed the Potomac below Harper's Ferry in the early part of October, General Lee would have recrossed into Maryland. As above explained, the Army was not in condition to move until late in October, and in the meantime, circumstances had changed. The period had arrived when a sudden and great rise of the Potomac might be looked for at any moment. The season of bad roads and difficult movements was approaching, which would naturally deter the enemy from exposing himself very far from his base, and his movements all appeared to indicate a falling back from the river towards his supplies. Under these circumstances, I felt at liberty to disregard the possibility of the enemy's recrossing the Potomac and determined to select the line east of the Blue Ridge, feeling convinced that it would secure me the largest accession of force and the most cordial support of the President, whose views from the beginning were in favor of that line. The subject of the defense of the line of the Upper Potomac after the advance of the main army had long occupied my attention. I desired to place Harper's Ferry and its dependencies in a strong state of defense, and frequently addressed the General-in-Chief upon the subject of the erection of field works and permanent bridges there, asking for the funds necessary to accomplish the purpose. Although I did my best to explain, as clearly as I was able, that I did not wish to erect permanent works of masonry, and that neither the works nor the permanent bridges had any reference to the advance of the army, but solely to the permanent occupation of Harper's Ferry, I could never make the General-in-Chief understand my wishes but was refused the funds necessary to erect the field works, on the ground that there was no appropriation for the erection of permanent fortifications, and was not allowed to build the permanent bridge, on the ground that the main army could not be delayed in its movements until its completion. Of course I never thought of delaying the advance of the army for that purpose, and so stated repeatedly. End of chapter 38「Thirty-nine of Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 39. Crossing the Potomac. The March of a Great Army. Overtaking the Enemy. Another Battle Imminent. Removed from the Command. Burnside Brings the Order. Farewells to the Army On the 25th of October, the pontoon bridge at Berlin was constructed, there being already one across the Potomac and another across the Shenandoah at Harper's Ferry. On the 26th, two divisions of the Ninth Corps and Pleasanton's Brigade of Cavalry crossed at Berlin and occupied Lovettsville. The 1st, 6th, and 9th Corps, the Cavalry, and Reserve Artillery crossed at Berlin between the 26th of October and the 2nd of November. The 2nd and 5th Corps crossed at Harper's Ferry between the 29th of October and 1st of November. 
Heavy rains delayed the movement considerably in the beginning, and the 1st, 5th, and 6th Corps were obliged to halt at least one day at the crossings to complete, as far as possible, the necessary supplies that could not be procured at an earlier period. The plan of campaign I adopted during the advance was to move the army well in hand parallel to the Blue Ridge, taking Warrenton as the point of direction for the main army, seizing each pass on the Blue Ridge by detachments as we approached it, and guarding them after we had passed as long as they would enable the enemy to trouble our communications with the Potomac. It was expected that we would unite with the 11th Corps and Sickles Division near Thoroughfare Gap. We depended upon Harper's Ferry and Berlin for supplies until the Manassas Gap Railway was reached. When that occurred, the passes in our rear were to be abandoned, and the army massed ready for action or movement in any direction. It was my intention, if, upon reaching Ashby's or any other pass, I found that the enemy were in force between it and the Potomac in the valley of the Shenandoah, to move into the valley and endeavor to gain their rear. I hardly hoped to accomplish this, but did expect that by striking in between Culpeper Courthouse and Little Washington, I could either separate their army and beat them in detail, or else force them to concentrate as far back as Gordonsville, and thus place the Army of the Potomac in position either to adopt the Fredericksburg line of advance upon Richmond, or to be removed to the peninsula if, as I apprehended, it were found impossible to supply it by the Orange and Alexandria Railroad beyond Culpeper. On the 27th of October, the remaining divisions of the Ninth Corps crossed to Berlin, and Pleasanton's cavalry advanced to Purcellville. The concentration of the Sixth Corps, delayed somewhat by intelligence as to the movements of the enemy near Hedgesville, etc., was commenced on this day, and the First Corps was already in motion for Berlin. On the 28th, the First Corps and the General Headquarters reached Berlin. On the 29th, the Reserve Artillery crossed and encamped near Lovettsville. Stoneman's division, temporarily attached to the Ninth Corps, occupied Leesburg. Avril's cavalry brigade moved towards Berlin from Hagerstown. Two divisions of the Ninth Corps moved to Wheatland and one to Waterford. The Second Corps commenced the passage of the Shenandoah at Harper's Ferry and moved into the valley east of Loudoun Heights. On the 30th, the First Corps crossed at Berlin and encamped near Lovettsville, and the Second Corps completed the passage of the Shenandoah. The 5th Corps commenced its march from Sharpsburg to Harper's Ferry. On the 31st, the 2nd Corps moved to the vicinity of Hillsboro. The 6th Corps reached Boonesboro. The 5th Corps reached Harper's Ferry, one division crossing the Shenandoah. On the 1st of November, the 1st Corps moved to Purcellville and Hamilton, the 2nd Corps to Wood Grove, the 5th Corps to Hillsboro, the 6th Corps reached Berlin, one division crossing. Pleasanton's cavalry occupied Philemont, having a sharp skirmish there and at Bloomfield. On November 2nd, the 2nd Corps occupied Snickers Gap, the 5th Corps Snickersville, the 6th Corps crossed Potomac and encamped near Wheatland, the 9th Corps advanced to Bloomfield, Union, and Philemont. Pleasanton drove the enemy out of Union, Averill was ordered to join Pleasanton, the enemy offered no serious resistance to the occupation of Snickers Gap, but advanced to gain possession of it with a column of some 5,000 to 6,000 infantry, who were driven back by a few rounds from our rifled guns. On the 3rd, the 1st Corps moved to Philemont, Union, Bloomfield, etc., the 2nd Corps to the vicinity of Upperville, the 5th Corps remained at Snickers Gap, the 6th Corps moved to Purcellville, the 9th Corps moved towards Upperville. Pleasanton drove the enemy out of Upperville after a severe fight. On the 4th, the 2nd Corps took possession of Ashby's Gap. The 6th Corps reached Union. The 9th Corps, Upperville. The cavalry occupied Piedmont. On the 5th, the 1st Corps moved to Rectortown and White Plains. One division of the 2nd Corps to the intersection of the Paris and Piedmont with the Upperville and Barbers Road. The 6th Corps to the Aldi Pike, east of Upperville. The Ninth Corps beyond the Manassas Railroad, between Piedmont and Salem, with a brigade at Manassas Gap. The cavalry under Averill had a skirmish at Manassas Gap, and the brigade of Pleasanton gained a handsome victory over superior numbers at Barber's Crossroads. Bayard's cavalry had some sharp skirmishing in front of Salem. On the 6th, the 1st Corps advanced to Warrenton, the 2nd Corps to Rectortown, 
the fifth corps commenced its movement from snickers gap to white plains the ninth corps to waterloo and vicinity on the rappahannock the eleventh corps was at new baltimore thoroughfare and hopewell's gaps sickles division guarding the orange and alexandria railroad from manassas junction towards warrington junction the cavalry near flint hill bayard to cut off what there might be in warrington and to proceed to the rappahannock station november seventh general pleasanton was ordered to move towards little washington and sperryville and thence towards culpeper courthouse november eighth the second corps moved halfway to warrington the fifth corps to new baltimore november ninth the second and fifth corps reached warrington the sixth corps new baltimore late on the night of the seventh i received an order relieving me from the command of the army of the potomac and directing me to turn it over to general burnside which i at once did i had already given the orders for the movements of the eighth and ninth these orders were carried into effect without change the position in which i left the army as the result of the orders i had given was as follows the first second and fifth corps reserve artillery and general headquarters at warrenton the ninth corps on the line of the rappahannock in the vicinity of waterloo the sixth corps at new baltimore the eleventh corps at new baltimore gainesville and thoroughfare gap sickles division of the third corps on the orange and alexandria railroad from manassas junction to warrenton junction pleasanton across the rappahannock at amissville jefferson etc with his pickets at hazel river facing longstreet six miles from culpeper courthouse bayard near rappahannock station the army was thus massed near Warrenton, ready to act in any required direction, perfectly in hand, and in admirable condition and spirits. I doubt whether, during the whole period that I had the honor to command the Army of the Potomac, it was in such excellent condition to fight a great battle. When I gave up the command to General Burnside, the best information in our possession indicated that Longstreet was immediately in our front near Culpeper. Jackson, with one, perhaps both, of the hills, near chester and thornton's gaps with a mass of their force west of the blue ridge the reports from general pleasanton on the advance indicated the possibility of separating the two wings of the enemy's forces and either beating longstreet separately or forcing him to fall back at least upon gordonsville to effect his junction with the rest of the army the following is the report of general pleasanton at this time and from the seventh instant my advance pickets were at hazel river within six miles of culpeper besides having my flank pickets towards chester and thornton's gaps extended to gaines crossroads and newby's crossroads with numerous patrols in the direction of woodville little washington and sperryville the information gained from these parties and also from deserters prisoners contrabands as well as citizens established the fact of longstreet with his command being at culpeper while Jackson, with D.H. Hill, with their respective commands, were in the Shenandoah Valley, on the western side of the Blue Ridge, covering Chester and Thornton's gaps, and expecting us to attempt a pass through and attack them. As late as the 17th of November, a contraband just from Strasburg came into my camp and reported that D.H. Hill's corps was two miles beyond that place, on the railroad to Mount Jackson. Hill was tearing up the road and destroying the bridges under the impression that we intended to follow into that valley, and was en route for Staunton. Jackson's corps was between Strasburg and Winchester. Ewell and A.P. Hill were with Jackson. Provisions were scarce, and the rebels were obliged to keep moving to obtain them. On the 10th of November, General Pleasanton was attacked by Longstreet, with one division of infantry and Stuart's cavalry, but repulsed the attack. This indicates the relative position of our army and that of the enemy at the time I was relieved from the command. Had I remained in command, I should have made the attempt to divide the enemy, as before suggested, and could he have been brought to a battle within reach of my supplies, I cannot doubt that the result would have been a brilliant victory for our army. Brackets. The following discretionary authority to General Halleck, in the handwriting of Mr. Lincoln, was found among the papers of General Halleck after his death and transmitted by his widow to the War Department. It is not probable that General McClellan ever heard of it. End brackets. Executive Mansion, Washington. By direction of the President, it is ordered that Major General McClellan be relieved from the command of the Army of the Potomac, and that Major General Burnside take the command of that army. Also that Major General Hunter take command of the Corps in said army, which is now commanded by General Burnside. 
that Major General Fitzjohn Porter be relieved from the command of the Corps he now commands in said army, and that Major General Hooker take command of said Corps. The General-in-Chief is authorized in discretion to issue an order substantially as the above, forthwith or so soon as he may deem proper. A. Lincoln, November 5, 1862. When we broke up the camps on the Upper Potomac and moved in advance, the army was in fine order for another battle. The troops in the best of spirits, full of confidence in me, and I was then, I believe, capable of handling an army in the field as I had never been before. I felt that I could fight a great battle. The march was admirably conducted and is worthy of study. In the course of the 7th of November, I heard incidentally that a special train had brought out from Washington General Buckingham who had left the railway very near our camp, and, without coming to see me, had proceeded through a driving snowstorm several miles to Burnside's camp. I at once suspected that he brought the order relieving me from command, but kept my own counsel. Late at night, I was sitting alone in my tent, writing to my wife. All the staff were asleep. Suddenly someone knocked upon the tent pole, and, upon my invitation to enter, there appeared Burnside and Buckingham, both looking very solemn. I received them kindly and commenced conversation upon general subjects in the most unconcerned manner possible. After a few moments, Buckingham said to Burnside, Well, General, I think we had better tell General McClellan the object of our visit. I very pleasantly said that I should be glad to learn it. Whereupon Buckingham handed me the two orders of which he was the bearer. Headquarters of the Army, Washington, November 5, 1862. Major General McClellan, commanding, etc. General, on receipt of the order of the President, sent herewith, you will immediately turn over your command to Major General Burnside and repair to Trenton, New Jersey, reporting on your arrival at that place by telegraph for further orders. Very respectfully, your obedient servant, H.W. Halleck, General-in-Chief. General Orders Number 182, War Department, Adjutant General's Office, Washington, November 5, 1862. By direction of the President of the United States, it is ordered that Major General McClellan be relieved from the command of the Army of the Potomac, and that Major General Burnside take command of that army. By order of the Secretary of War, E.D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General. I saw that both, especially Buckingham, were watching me most intently while I opened and read the orders. I read the papers with a smile, immediately turned to Burnside, and said, Well, Burnside, I turn the command over to you. They soon retired, Burnside having begged me to remain for a few days with the army, and I having consented to do so, though I wished to leave the next morning. Before we broke up from the Maryland side of the Potomac, I had said to Burnside that, as he was second in rank in the army, I wished him to be as near me as possible on the march, and that he must keep himself informed of the condition of affairs. I took special pains during the march to have him constantly informed of what I was doing, the positions of the various corps, etc., and he ought to have been able to take the reins in his hands without a day's delay. The order depriving me of the command created an immense deal of deep feeling in the army, so much so that many were in favor of my refusing to obey the order and of marching upon Washington to take possession of the government. My chief purpose in remaining with the army as long as I did after being relieved was to calm this feeling in which I succeeded. I will not attempt to describe my own feelings nor the scenes attending my farewell to the army. They are beyond my powers of description. What words in truth could convey to the mind such a scene? Thousands of brave men who under my very eye had changed from raw recruits to veterans of many fields, shedding tears like children in their ranks, as they bade goodbye to the general who had just led them to victory after the defeats they had seen under another leader. Could they have foreseen the future, their feelings would not have been less intense. Brackets. The following was McClellan's farewell to the Army. End brackets. Headquarters, Army of the Potomac, Camp near Rectortown, Virginia, November 7, 1862. Officers and Soldiers of the Army of the Potomac. An order of the President devolves upon Major General Burnside the command of this army. In parting from you, I cannot express the love and gratitude I bear to you. As an army, you have grown up under my care. In you, I have never found doubt or coldness. The battles you have fought under my command will proudly live in our nation's history. 
the glory you have achieved, our mutual perils and fatigues, the graves of our comrades fallen in battle and by disease, the broken forms of those whom wounds and sickness have disabled, the strongest associations which can exist among men, unite us still by an indissoluble tie. We shall ever be comrades in supporting the constitution of our country and the nationality of its people. George B. McClellan, Major General, U.S. Army. End of chapter 39. Chapter 40 of McClellan's Own Story by George Brinton McClellan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mike Manalakis. Chapter 40. Private Letters. October 1st to November 10th, 1862. October 1st, Sharpsburg, 7.30 p.m. Received this morning a mysterious dispatch from which I inferred that the President was on his way hither went to Harper's Ferry and found him with half a dozen Western officers. He remains at Harper's Ferry tonight. October 2nd, A.M. I found the President at General Sumner's headquarters at Harper's Ferry. None of the Cabinet were with him, merely some Western officers, such as McLernan and others. His ostensible purpose is to see the troops and the battlefield. I incline to think that the real purpose of his visit is to push me into a premature advance into Virginia. I may be mistaken, but think not. The real truth is that my army is not fit to advance. The old regiments are reduced to mere skeletons and are completely tired out. They need rest and filling up. The new regiments are not fit for the field. The remains of Pope's army are pretty well broken up and ought not to be made to fight for some little time yet. Cavalry and artillery horses are broken down. So it goes. These people don't know what an army requires and therefore act stupidly. October 3rd. I was riding with the President all yesterday afternoon and expect to do the same today. He seems in quite a good humor, is accompanied only by Western people. October 4th. The President is still here and goes to Frederick this morning. I will probably accompany him as far as the battlefield of South Mountain, so that my day will be pretty well used up. October 5th. The President left us about 11 yesterday morning. I went with him as far as over the battlefield of South Mountain, and on my way thither was quite surprised to meet Mr. Aspinwall en route to my camp. The president was very kind personally, told me he was convinced I was the best general in the country, etc., etc. He was very affable, and I really think he does feel very kindly towards me personally. I showed him the battlefields, and am sure he departed with a more vivid idea of the great difficulty of the task we had accomplished. Mr. Aspinwall is decidedly of the opinion that it is my duty to submit to the President's proclamation and quietly continue doing my duty as a soldier. I presume he is right and am at least sure that he is honest in his opinion. I shall surely give his views full consideration. He is of the opinion that the nation cannot stand the burdens of the war much longer and that a speedy solution is necessary. In this he is no doubt correct and I hope sincerely that another successful battle may conclude my part of the work. October blank, 1862, Pleasant Valley I received today a very handsome series of resolutions from the councils of Philadelphia, thanking me for the last campaign. The councils pitch into the government for not thanking me most beautifully. The phrase about my having organized victory is a cut at Stanton, who last winter issued an order scouting the idea of organizing victory, and rested on the sword of Gideon and Donnybrook Fair. I believe I will try to acknowledge them now, so I can send you the resolutions tomorrow. Pray keep them for May, with the thanks of Congress, etc. I have also some resolutions of the Councils of Baltimore, which I have not yet replied to, and which I will send you in a day or two. October 25th. I hope my bridge at Berlin is finished, and if so, I can cross some troops today, and shall be all ready to march the moment the cavalry is ready, which will be shortly. I don't think Lee will fight us nearer than Richmond. I expect no fight in this vicinity. My report is at last finished, and will, I presume, be copied today. I see that there is much impatience throughout the country for a move, but am crippled by want of horses. I sent Bishop McIlvain over to Harper's Ferry in my ambulance, 
He is accompanied by the Reverend Mr. Clements. October 26th. I move a respectable number of troops across the Potomac today, the beginning of the general movement, which will, however, require several days to accomplish, for the cavalry is still terribly off. Yesterday, a telegram received from the President asking what my cavalry had done since the Battle of Antietam to fatigue anything. It was one of those little flings that I can't get used to when they are not merited. Pleasant Valley, October, blank. Since about three this morning, it has been blowing a perfect gale, several tents blown over, etc. The bishop preached a very good extempore sermon on faith, a very impressive one it was, too. Service was in the little brick church that you remember just beyond the camp in the direction of Brownsville. They are working very hard to tie my tent fast with ropes. Hope they will succeed. I strongly suspect our chances for breakfast are decidedly slim. Your father and I have been waiting for a very long time, and affairs don't seem to make progress. I confess that I am becoming hungry and cross, very hungry and rather cross. You had better send me two uniform frock coats. I begin to present a terribly poverty-stricken appearance. Ah, Andrew says that breakfast will soon be ready, that the Whittles is very slow cooking this here windy morning. I hope his estimate of time will not be out of the way much. Pleasant Valley, October 27th. I commenced the crossing yesterday. I returned a few moments ago from a trip to the blanks to say goodbye to the bishop and to present your album. The visit was so characteristic that I can't omit telling you of it. I found the family at dinner in the kitchen. They wanted me to take some dinner in the dining room, but I insisted upon sitting down with them in the kitchen, which delighted them beyond measure. The old lady went nearly frantic to think of General McClellan sitting down to dinner in the kitchen just like any common man, etc., etc. I got a little more than I bargained for in the shape of the guard coming in before I got through, but I kept on. The guard was rather more put out than I was, as he was a regular, but he could not get out of the scrape without a scene, so he went with, through with it. The album created a terrific scene of delight. More oh mys were expended on it than I have heard for a couple of years or so. The old lady went almost out of her senses. I put the photographs in it for them, and wrote her name, with your regards, on one of the blank leaves. All sort of inquiries were made about you, the baby, and mamma, and when I left Mrs. Blank, wished me to kiss the baby for her and give gold love to you. The old lady said that she'd been a mind to send me for some beef, so I told Bates just now to get a good large piece and take it up to them. They would not take any pay from the bishop, because Colonel Hammond had sent more money to pay his bill than they thought right, so they squared accounts and cleared their consciences by refusing any pay from the bishop. Some artist of an illustrated paper had been there taking a sketch of the house, and left them a very good copy, which delighted them very much. I gave them that copy of the President to myself, which you sent them, so that I think they are now a very happy family. All of them sent very kind messages to you, which you can consider delivered. October, blank, Berlin. We are now near Berlin and have a much better camp than the last one. My tent is at the bottom of a wooded ravine and is perfectly sheltered from the wind. I am as comfortable as can be in a tent and have a grass carpet instead of the dust and dirt which made the floor of my last tent. October 30th, Berlin. I have just been put in an excellent humor, question mark by seeing that, instead of sending the drafted men to fill the old regiments, as had been promised me, they are forming them into new regiments. Also that, in face of the great want of cavalry with this army, they are sending the new cavalry regiments from Pennsylvania to Louisville instead of hither. Blind and foolish they have ever been in Washington, and so I fear they will continue to the end. Berlin, October, blank. It will not do for me to visit Washington now. The tone of the telegrams I receive from the authorities is such as to show that they will take advantage of anything possible to do me all the harm they can, and if I went down I should at once be accused of purposely delaying the movement. Moreover, the condition of things is such that I ought not to leave just now. The army is in the midst of the preliminary movements for the main march, and I must be at hand in this critical moment of the operation." If you could know the mean character of the dispatches I receive, you would boil over with anger. When it is possible to misunderstand, and when it is not possible, whenever there is a chance of a wretched innuendo, then it comes. 
but the good of the country requires me to submit to all this. Berlin, October 31st. I don't expect to move headquarters from here for a couple of days, but in the meanwhile the troops are constantly crossing and the army getting into position for the advance. October 31st. If you can get to a comparatively permanent place, you had better write to Dr. V to send the sash and saber by express to you, for I should hate to lose the ugly, rusty old thing, that is, if you would value it any, and perhaps our little child might value it after you and I are dead and gone. Miss Blank and to Mrs. Blank were at camp today. Of course there was a general row among the youngsters, and I came in for my share of the trouble in the shape of a visitation for an hour or so. I had a long visit from Mr. Bancroft, the historian, today. October 31st, after midnight. From the dispatches just received, I think I will move headquarters over the river tomorrow. The advance is getting a little too far away from me, and I wish to have everything well under my own hands, as I am responsible. November 2nd, Berlin. We are about starting to Wheatland, some eight or nine miles on the other side of the river. Pleasanton had considerable skirmishing yesterday with Stuart's cavalry. They exceed ours vastly in numbers. There may be some infantry skirmishing today, but nothing serious. November 4th. Slept under a tree last night, sharing what I had in the way of a bed with General Reynolds. There is some prospect of a fight today, but cannot tell exactly until I catch the extreme advance a couple of miles further on. November 4th, 11.30 p.m., near Middleburg. We are in the full tide of success, so far as it is or can be successful to advance without a battle. Tomorrow night, I hope to strike the railroad and telegraph again. No telegraph within 25 miles of this. November 5th, 9 p.m., camp near Rectortown. After a considerable amount of marching and skirmishing, we have worked our way thus far down into rebeldom. We have had delightful weather for marching and a beautiful country to travel through. We left Berlin on Sunday morning, the headquarters stopping at Wheatland, but I heard firing and rode to the front, going all the way to Snickers Gap, to the top of the mountain, and spending the night at Snickersville. Next morning I rode to meet the train, but heard some more firing, and rode again towards the front, and spent the night near Bloomfield, camp being some miles back. At Snickersville I got a bed in a house to sleep in. At Bloomfield I slept under a tree in the woods, so that last night I was very glad, after another long ride, to get to my tent again. Pleasanton has been doing very well again, has had some skirmishing pretty much every day. Today he came across Jeb Stewart and thrashed him badly. Jeb outnumbered him two to one, but was well whipped. There was some very pretty charges made. November 6th, 1 p.m., camp near Rectortown. The army still advances, but the machine is so huge and complicated that it is slow in its motions. November 7th, 2 p.m. Sumner returned last night. Howard returned this morning. I go to Warrington tomorrow. Reynolds is there now, Burnside at Waterloo, Bayard in front. Pleasanton and Avril are trying to catch Jeb Stewart again near Flint Hills. Couch is here and moves tomorrow towards Warrington. Porter and Franklin are at White Plains. Porter moves tomorrow to New Baltimore, thence next day to Warrington. Franklin moves day after tomorrow to New Baltimore. Sigel will remain at Thoroughfare Gap in the vicinity. The Manassas Gap Road is in such bad order that we cannot depend upon it thus far up for supplies. Gainesville will be the depot until the Orange and Alexandria Railroad is open to Warrington. We will have great difficulty in getting supplies by the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Its capacity has been overrated. Lee is at Gordonsville. G.W. Smith was yesterday driven out of Warrington. 11.30 p.m. Another interruption, this time more important. It was in the shape of Burnside, accompanied by General Buckingham, the Secretary's Adjutant General. They brought with them the order relieving me from the command of the Army of the Potomac, and assigning Burnside to the command. No cause is given. I am ordered to turn over the command immediately and repair to Trenton, New Jersey, and on my arrival there to report by telegraph for further orders. Of course I was much surprised, but as I read the order in the presence of General Buckingham, I am sure that not the slightest expression of feeling was visible on my face, which he watched closely. They have made a great mistake. Alas for my poor country. I know in my inmost heart she never had a truer servant. I have informally turned over the command to Burnside, 
but shall go tomorrow to Warrington with him, and perhaps remain a day or two there in order to give him all the information in my power. Do not be at all worried. I am not. I have done the best I could for my country. To the last I have done my duty as I understand it. That I must have made many mistakes I cannot deny. I do not see any great blunders, but no one can judge of himself. Our consolation must be that we have tried to do what was right. If we have failed, it was not our fault. 8 a.m. I am about starting for Warrington. Warrington, Sunday, a.m. I expect to start tomorrow morning and may get to Washington in time to take the afternoon train. I shall not stop in Washington longer than for the next train and will not go to see anybody. I shall go on just as quietly as I can and make as little fuss as possible. The officers and men feel terribly about the change. I learned today that the men are very sullen and have lost their good spirits entirely. It made me feel very badly yesterday when I rode among them and saw how bright and cheerful they looked and how glad they were to see me. Poor fellows, they did not know the change that had occurred. Warrington, November 10th, 2 p.m. I am very well and taking leave of the men. I did not know before how much they loved me, nor how dear they were to me. Gray-haired men came to me with tears streaming down their cheeks. I never before had to exercise so much self-control. The scenes of today repay me for all that I have endured. The End End of Chapter 40 End of McClellan's Own Story by George Brenton McClellan